area, this masjid, so important to Islam, so important to Muslims. And to increase our love for the area. Because as Muslims, we love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves an area, then we love that area. I mean, look at Mecca for example. We love Mecca. We love Medina. Why do we love Mecca and Medina? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put the love of these two cities in the hearts of the believers. Imagine if Masjid al-Haram was not there in Mecca. Would you even consider going to Mecca for your vacation? Mountains, desert, the heat. Maybe you would never think of going to a place like there are many places like Mecca from the geographical perspective which are very arid, dry, hot, mountainous, but we don't go to those places. Why do we like to go and visit Mecca? Because of the masjid there. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this land. Similarly, the city of Medina. So, we love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. And one of the areas, one of the geographical locations which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and has blessed is Al-Quds. The Holy Land, which includes not only Palestine, not only the city of Jerusalem, but the surrounding areas. Bilad al-Sham as a total, the lands of Asham, the lands of Syria, the greater Syria region. And we are going to, inshallah, learn from tonight's lecture why. This, in, this area is important and why sh we should love these places and why we should from time to time remind ourselves and our children and our families about the importance of these lands. First and foremost, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran described this land as a blessed land. In Surah Al-Isra, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned the night journey of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بَعْدَا قُولَعُوا بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله باركنا حوله باركنا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying praise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the one who took his servant from Masjid al-Haram in Mecca to the furthest mosque which is the mosque in Jerusalem Masjid al-Aqsa and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that not only is this masjid a blessed masjid but the land around this masjid is blessed the cities around this masjid is blessed. The countries around this masjid, they are all blessed. This is a blessed land. This is a land which has barakah. Barakna hawlahu. What does it mean that the land has barakah? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts barakah in something. What does that really mean? When we say Allah has put barakah in my food, Allah has put barakah in my money, what it means is that that particular food gives you happiness. That that particular money gives you satisfaction. You could have millions of dollars and if you don't have barakah in that money, you'll not feel satisfied. And you could have a little bit of money and Allah put that satisfaction in your heart, that barakah in that money, it will give you happiness. You will feel relieved. You will feel satisfied with that money. Similarly, this land and the land around it, when you go there, how do you feel? You feel satisfied. You feel happy. Spiritually. We're talking about spiritual happiness here. We're talking about spiritual satisfaction here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this land. The entire neighboring land of Al Masjid Al Aqsa is blessed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also called it in the Quran the Holy Land. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it the Holy Land. Everyone can hear me in the back? 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Musa alayhi salam when Musa alayhi salam told his people to enter this land what did he say to his people? Ya qawmi dukulul awbal muqaddasa O my nation, enter this holy land Ardul muqaddasa It is a muqaddas land It is a holy land Why is it a holy land? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this land with holy prophets This land has seen many and many and many prophets this land has seen a lot of scripture, a lot of wahi, a lot of revelation descend. I mean, imagine, wouldn't that land be special where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wahi comes down? Why is Jabal al Nur so important? Why is Ghar Hira so important? Why are the masajid around Medina, some of them so important? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent revelation in those areas. And a land which is chosen to receive the revelation, where the revelation descends, is the best of lands. Is a blessed land. Is a holy land. Just like the people who are chosen to receive wahi are the best of people. And the angel who brings down wahi is the best of angels. Similarly, the land on which wahi descends, revelation descends, is the best of lands. So it is a holy land. This is a land, the masjid in it, originally built by Ibrahim alayhi salam. By Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam built the two holy mosques. We have total three. The third one in Medina, we know who built it. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But the other two, the one in Mecca, Masjid al-Haram, and the one in Jerusalem, Al-Quds, Masjid al-Aqsa, was built originally by Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was asked, what was the time gap between the Masjid in Mecca and the Masjid in Jerusalem? Masjid al-Aqsa and Masjid al-Haram. Anyone knows what was the time gap? 40. <laughs> I learned new sign for 40. So you do this four fingers and that means 40, mashallah. All right, so 40 years. It, the difference between Masjid al-Haram and Masjid al-Aqsa was 40 years. So these are very close to each other in time, in history. And the same great prophet, our Nabi Ibrahim, Khalilullah, the friend of Allah, the intimate friend of Allah, is the one who was blessed with this job of building the two holy masajid. This is the place, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, where Sulaiman Ali Salam, Prophet Sulaiman Ali Salam, he built this beautiful masjid. He rebuilt the masjid and he rebuilt it in a grand manner. The Jews to this day call it the Temple of Solomon. The Temple of Solomon. For us, we don't call it Temple. Say Masjid. It was a grand Masjid which Prophet Sulaiman Ali Salam he built. Haikal. The Haikal Sulaiman. And then, this is the Masjid where Musa Ali Salam he wanted to enter this Masjid. Remember Musa alayhi salam, what was his mission? To take the Bani Israel out of Egypt, Mesur, and take them to where? To the Holy Land, to Philistine. But because they were not ready to fight, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished them and they got lost in the Sinai Desert for 40 years. And Musa alayhi salam had to suffer with them. Musa alayhi salam wished and desired to enter the Holy Land but he was not able to. This land is desired by the Anbiya. Can you imagine the importance of a city, importance of a land where Prophet Musa, he wishes he could enter this land, he could live in this land, he could make Salah in this land. This is Al-Aqsa. This is the region of Philistine, the Bilad al-Sham. And Musa salam, when he knew his death was coming, he made a dua to Allah. Ya Allah, Give me my death as close as possible to this land. 
I cannot enter it. It is not destined for me to enter it. But at least I want to die as close as possible to this land. And Ibn Kathir, he mentions in his book, the stories of the prophets in the story of Musa salam, that Musa salam, died a throw's distance. When you take a rock and you can throw it, that's the distance how far Musa salam, died from the Holy Land. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted his dua. He could see the Holy Land. He could see the Holy Land from the place where he passed away. And he was buried in that area. And on the night journey when the Prophet ﷺ was coming back, he saw the grave of Musa salam near the Holy Land. He saw the grave of Musa salam near the Holy Land. This is the land we are talking about. A land for which Musa salam he desired to enter it. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this masjid, Masjid al-Aqsa, the temple built by Sulaiman alayhi salam, originally built by Ibrahim alayhi salam, expanded by Sulaiman alayhi salam, is the masjid where Maryam grew, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, who was the one who was made the guardian of Maryam in the temple, in the masjid? Which prophet was given the charge of raising this young Beautiful, pious girl, Prophet Zakaria. Prophet Zakaria was the chief Imam of the Masjid. Prophet Zakaria was the chief leader of the Masjid. This is the Masjid where Maryam grew, and in one of the quarters of the Masjid, she would have miracles. Allah gave miracles to Maryam in one of her chambers. What was the miracle reported in the Quran? She would get food items which she was not supposed to get. The fruits of the summer in the winter time. The fruits of the winter in the summer time. She is receiving miracles and when Zakaria asked her, how do you get this? Where do you get this from? He said, my Lord feeds me. My Lord feeds me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was feeding Maryam. This is the masjid we are talking about where Maryam grew up. This is the masjid we're talking about where Isa salam grows up later on and he teaches. He teaches the Jewish people about Allah. He teaches the rabbis about their mistakes. He corrects their mistakes. This is the masjid. Even to this day in the New Testament it is written that Isa salam went into the temple, the masjid, and he threw out the money sellers. These people who were making money inside the masjid, they had started businesses inside the masjid. Imagine if somebody would start a business here in our masjid. <laughs> Opens up a stall and every time we come in, selling his stuff, making money out of the people who are coming in. But not only were they making business, making money, they were dealing in interest. They were dealing in riba. And Isa salam went and threw them out of the masjid cast them out, purify the masjid. This is the masjid we are talking about, Masjid al-Aqsa. In Al-Quds, there is the Masjid al-Aqsa. So Al-Quds is the holy land. Bilad al-Sham, the lands around, around Syria, Palestine, Jordan, and all of these lands which are surrounding this masjid. And one prayer in Masjid al-Aqsa is equivalent to 200 and 50 prayers elsewhere. 250 prayers, if you're going to pray 250 prayers in this musallah, you pray one prayer in Masjid al-Aqsa, they are equal. 250 prayers here, how many days is that? It will take you 250 prayers, five prayers a day. Huh? Who's good at math? Hmm? 50 days. 250 days. So five prayers every day. No, I'm saying five for those who pray five prayers a day. Not those who come once a day. For them it is going to take centuries. Huh? 50 days. 50 days you are going to come here almost two months. You will pray five times a day in this masjid. Is equal to one prayer in Masjid Al-Aqsa. That's how much the rewards are. That's how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this land. Bless this masjid. What about Masjid al Nabawi? If you pray how many prayers in other masajid, it's equal to one prayer in Masjid al Nabawi. One thousand. 
1,000 prayers elsewhere is equal to one prayer in Masjid al nabawi What about Masjid al-Haram? Masjid al-Haram, how many prayers do you have to pray in other masajid to equal one prayer in Masjid al-Haram? Yes, Rayyan, you know the answer? Very good, mashallah, mashallah. 100,000 prayers. 100,000 prayers. Can you imagine this? You and me all spend a lifetime in other masajid praying. We cannot equal this guy who is praying in Masjid al-Haram day in and day out. That's why those people are blessed. They have an advantage. But it is sad sometimes when you hear stories that when the Adhan goes in Masjid al-Haram, some of the shopkeepers, they put down the shutters. They don't want to leave their business and go and pray Masjid al-Haram. How we would desire that we could pray five times a day in Masjid al-Haram. SubhanAllah. Masjid al-Nabawi. SubhanAllah. Masjid al-Aqsa. SubhanAllah. So this is the importance of these masajid. In rewards, you cannot compete with these masajid. No masjid can come near them in rewards. And the Prophet wasallam said, Soon there will come a time when if a man has a spot of land as big as his horse's robe from which he can see Baytul Maqdis, see this masjid, that is better for him than the whole world. If you can live near this masjid, the Prophet is saying soon there will come a time when if you can see this masjid, you have a, a small piece of property next to Masjid Al-Aqsa, it doesn't even cover a rope. Small piece of land, a spot where you can stand equal to a rope and you can see Masjid Al-Aqsa, it is better for you than the whole world. That's the importance of Masjid Al-Aqsa. It is a valuable land. It is a land which, if, you, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you to visit, then Allah has blessed you. How many here has visited Masjid al-Aqsa? Anyone gone there? MashaAllah. One sister, one brother there. MashaAllah, excellent. See? Two. So two versus one. Hmm? Any sisters? Other sisters who went to this masjid? Okay. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So you see, it's not easy. <laughs> It's not easy to get there, but if you do get there, Alhamdulillah, say Alhamdulillah for the blessing of being able to pray in these masajid. It is the place of Wahi where revelation came down. It is the homeland of the prophets. You cannot imagine how many Anbiya lived and prayed in this land. You cannot imagine. I mean, entire, almost all of the Bani Israel prophets, almost all of them lived there, and they practiced their deen there, they taught there, they received wahi there. Musa is one of the exceptions. He could not. But if you talk about Ibrahim, you talk about his son, Ishaq, talk about Yaqub, talk about the other Anbiya, Yusuf was taken at a young age also, but he also lived some part of his life there. And then later on, many, many Anbiya, you know, all the way up to Isa lived and practiced their deen in this land. The Prophet ﷺ was taken to Bayt al-Maqdis on his night journey from Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa. Al-Isra wal-Miraj. Okay, Al-Isra wal-Miraj. What is Al-Isra? Al-Isra means in Arabic the night journey. That is when the Prophet ﷺ traveled from Mecca all the way to this masjid, to Jerusalem. And Al-Miraj means going up, okay, ascending. Or the thing which takes you up is Al-Miraj. So the journey of the Prophet from Jerusalem to the heavens, to the skies, where he meets the souls of the Anbiya, where he goes all the way, crosses Sidratul Muntaha, the tree, the lote tree, even Jibreel cannot go any further. And then the Prophet ﷺ goes in the divine presence. That is Al-Miraj. Where did this journey take place? It took place from Jerusalem. It took place from the Holy Land, Al-Quds. You have to understand what a great relief this journey was personally for the Prophet ﷺ. According to many historians, Islamic historians, this journey took place near the end of the Meccan period. 
when the Prophet ﷺ had not yet migrated to Medina. These were the last years in Mecca. And you know, if you have studied the seerah, how difficult those last years in Mecca were for the Muslims. For the Prophet ﷺ, there was the year of grief when the Prophet ﷺ lost Khadija. Khadija radiallahu anhu. What a woman she was in the life of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She was so important to the Prophet that later on when he had younger wives would always remember Khadija. She was 15 years older than him. 15 years. And yet his love for Khadija was unparalleled to his love for any other woman. Even Aisha radiallahu anha used to get jealous of Khadija even though she was not alive anymore. Because the Prophet remembered her so much. She supported the Prophet when everyone rejected him. She supported Islam with her money in the early years. She was there as a rock behind the Prophet ﷺ in support. And then the same year the Prophet lost his uncle, Abu Talib. Even though he was a non-Muslim, but he supported the Prophet. He was his guard. He was his guardian. He was the one who protected him from the Quraysh year in and year out. Took all the hits for his nephew, for his love, for his nephew. He lost both of these family members. And then, you know what happened in Taif. Taif was the difficult, most difficult day in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. One time Aisha anha asked the Prophet ﷺ, what was the most difficult day in your life? Was it the day of Uhud? She said, was it the day of Uhud? Because the day of Uhud, the Prophet ﷺ lost his teeth. And he was bleeding, his cheeks were bleeding. And he was almost killed in the battle. Was there that the most difficult day on you, O Prophet? He said, no, that was not the most difficult day. The most difficult day on me was the day of Pari. When I went to this town, this city near Mecca, and he invited the people to Islam, and in return, they threw rocks at him. They sent after him the boys, the mad people of the town, to chase him out of the city, and they almost killed him, stoned him to death. Stoned him to death. You know how much he was bleeding? He was bleeding so much that day that the blood was collecting in his shoes and his feet were sticking to his shoes. Have you ever experienced that? When blood makes your body stick to something? Blood is very sticky. It is like a glue. It glues on. That's how much the Prophet was bleeding. That the, the, the blood was collecting in his slippers and his feet were being glued on to his slippers. And he ran away. And we know what happened. So, these three incidents happened in the end of the Meccan period. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had the Isra al Miraj. It was as if Allah was giving a gift to his Prophet. It was as if Allah was saying, don't worry, I am with you. It was as if Allah was cheering up his Prophet. Imagine if you go through that kind of a year. You've lost the two best people in your life, and then one of the city mem you know, cities you go to almost kill you, treat you in this horrible way. Your companions are being killed. You're being oppressed, nowhere to turn to. How depressed and sad would you feel? The Prophet was feeling sad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifted. Do you know they say about the Prophet sallallahu that after Khadija radiallahu anha passed away, the Prophet did not smile for one whole year? After Khadija radiallahu anha passed away, the Prophet forgot how to smile for one whole year. That's how much he loved Khadija. Allah gave him this gift. This journey would give him that motivation again. This journey would bring back that happiness. Don't worry, O Muhammad, nobody is with you, I am with you. Come and have this journey, a unique journey which no one has experienced in the creation. No prophet has experienced this kind of a journey. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invited the Nabi up in the heavens to meet only our Nabi, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Where did that journey take place? From this beautiful land, from this holy land, from this blessed 
land. This is the place, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, where the best of three creations gather. The best of three creations. The best of the angels, Jibreel. The best of the prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And the best of the animals. What was the name of the animal who transported the prophet from Mecca to Jerusalem? Burak. Burak. From lightning, from birth, like lightning fast. It is described that this animal, the Prophet ﷺ described, this is a heavenly animal. This is not an animal from the dunya. This is an animal from another world. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it descend. And Jibreel السلام, told Burak, be careful, be ready. The best of the riders is about to ride on you. There has never been a rider better than the one who is about to ride on you. That means what? There were other riders before on al Burak too. We don't know who they were. But this is a special, a special animal. The Prophet ﷺ said, taller or bigger than a mule and smaller than a horse. That's the size of this animal. But this animal, when it jumps, you know how far he goes with one jump? The distance you can see. The distance you can see. That's the jump of this animal might be a mile or, so, or more than that. How far can you see if there's an open desert and you are somewhere, you know, in an open area, how far can your eye see? That's one step of this animal. So the best of animals gathered in this place, in Jerusalem. The best of the Ambiya, the best of the angels, and the best of the prophets. Also, this is the area where the Prophet ﷺ led the other Anbiya in Salah. Imagine, just imagine for a second. Take a deep breath and imagine a congregation of the Anbiya. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine this masjid full of Prophets? From Adam ﷺ to Muhammad ﷺ. And that's it. No other person. The best, the best of the people ever gathering in this masjid. And who's going to be their imam? Our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Wouldn't you think this is one of the best places on earth then? A gathering of the Anbiya, a salah by the Anbiya. Only one time in history has happened. Never happened before it, will never happen after it. Unique occasion. Unique Salah, unique congregation. All the Prophets gathered and leading them in prayer, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What a beautiful congregational prayer it must have been. Just two rak'ah. Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed two rak'ah. Can you imagine how beautiful those two rak'ah were? Imagine if you were standing in that row somewhere with Musa alayhi salam on your left and Isa alayhi salam on your right. And in front of you is Ibrahim alayhi salam, subhanAllah. And leading is your favorite, leading the prayer is your favorite party, and your favorite reciter, and your favorite imam, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is Masjid al-Aqsa, my dear brothers and sisters. This has never happened before, will never happen after. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Then the time for prayer came, and I led them in salah. No piece of property on earth has had a nobler gathering than this gathering. This land, this masjid, has also another significance for us. It is our first qibla. It was our first qibla. When the Muslims started making salah, which direction would they pray to? They prayed towards Jerusalem. They prayed towards Masjid al-Aqsa for the first 17 months in Medina. From the time the Prophet made Hijrah and the Muslims started to pray, first 17 months they were facing this Qibla. This was our first Qibla. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed it to the original Qibla, the Qibla of Ibrahim alayhi salam, the original Masjid, Masjid al-Haram. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested the believers. Tested the believers. Allah will test you from time to time. Because the disbelievers and the hypocrites, they question that. They said, what's wrong? What's going on? One day you face this way, now you face that way. Can't you make up your mind, guys? <laughs> Can't you make up your mind? Your God, Allah, doesn't he know which direction we need to pray to? Subhanallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. But Allah tests our obedience. If Allah tells us, go this way, will you go this way? Now tomorrow Allah tells you, no, don't go that way, go this way. Will you go that way? Is your loyalty towards Allah or is your loyalty towards logic? Because that's what people will say. Well, what's the logic here? I don't understand. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. If it doesn't make any sense, why should I do it? So who is your God, Allah or your intellect? Because a lot of us, our God, people made today, their God, their mind, their intelligence. This makes sense, this doesn't make sense. Ali radiallahu anhu, he has a famous statement about this. He said, if our religion was comprised of logic only, or depended on logic, everything had to make logic and sense, he said that it makes more sense to wipe the bottom of the sock and not the top of the sock. But I saw the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wipe the top of the sock. He's talking about the masa. When you make masa over the sock, what part of the sock do you make masa over? The top of it or the bottom of it? The top. What makes more sense and logic? Which part gets dirty? The top of it or the bottom of it when you walk? The bottom of it. So it would, according to sense and according to logic, it should have been the bottom which we should wipe. But Ali said, no. I saw the messenger wipe the top and that's why we wipe the top. Our loyalty first and foremost is to Allah and His Messenger. Whatever they say is the truth. Whether we understand it or we don't understand it. And if we show submission, then Allah will give us also the understanding of His religion. I'm not trying to tell you here that Islam is not making sense. Vast majority of the rulings, there is some wisdom in it which you can identify. But then there are rulings which we cannot understand their wisdom. Does not mean there is no wisdom in them. Allah knows the wisdom. Allah is Al-Hakim. But Allah has not shared that wisdom. Why? As a test. To see if we are going to obey Him when we don't really make sense out of it. So, this is a very, very critical point. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changed the Qibla, then the Muslims, the ones who were true Muslims, they changed it to Mecca. But the original Qibla for us was Al-Quds. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, there are almost 60 minor signs of the Day of Judgment. Close to 60 minor signs of the Day of Judgment. There are 10 major signs. Inshallah, in our Afira series, we're going to get to them eventually. Once we're done with the grave, topic of the grave, we're going to go to the signs of the Day of Judgment. Out of those 60, one of the signs of the Day of Judgment is the conquest of Jerusalem. The Prophet ﷺ said, the Day of Judgment will not occur until Jerusalem is taken by the Muslims. And that happened in the 18th year of Hijrah, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab Allah. This sign was fulfilled. The Muslims took control of the Holy Land in the time of Umar. Who was ruling Jerusalem in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, in the time of Islam? Who was ruling Jerusalem? Anyone know? Which empire? The Roman Empire had control of Jerusalem. What was the religion of the Romans? Huh? In the time of Islam, in the time of the Prophet what religion had they adopted by then? Christian. Christian. They had become Christian. Originally they were pagans, but in the year 325, there was a conference, and then the official religion of the Roman Empire became Christianity. The Christians, when they lost the battle, they had to give Muslims the land. They had a condition. They said, your leader, Omar, has to come and receive the keys of the city. Why? Because this is a holy land. We're not just going to give this key to a general. Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah was the general of the Muslims at this time. They said, we're not going to give you the keys. We want to surrender the city, but we'll surrender it to your top guy. Bring your top guy. Who's your top guy? At that time, the top guy was Umar ibn Khattab. Umar ibn Khattab, he receives the letter. 
with this condition, he consults the Sahaba. Some of them say, no, don't go. This is a trap. They might want to kill you. Others say, don't worry. In the name of Allah, go in the path of Allah. We are in control of the situation there. Go and receive the keys. So Umar ibn Khattab, he makes a journey to Jerusalem. With him is one servant. And imagine this. This is the Khalifa of the Muslims. He is the leader of the largest empire of the time. The largest empire of the time was the Islamic empire. He's the Khalifa. Doesn't have an army around him, no bodyguards, okay? no special military, no special procession leading him, you know, bulletproof cars, bombproof vehicles, right? Our presidents and prime ministers these days, they cannot travel even to the bathroom without some of these facilities. SubhanAllah. So, they, so Umar ibn Khattab goes, and Umar ibn Khattab, his servant, would take the reins, the rope, the camel, and he would go for half an hour. And then the next half an hour, Umar ibn Khattab said, you on the camel, and I am going to take the camel's reins. This is justice. This is justice. When you have somebody under your command, doesn't mean you abuse them. You do all the work, I'm going to act like a king. Sit back. No, justice demands that you be merciful to those under your command. Umar ibn Khattab, he has all the power in the world, but look at his level of justice. When it was time to enter Jerusalem, whose turn it was to sit on the camel? The servants. It was the servant's turn to sit on the camel. He's entering the city and the servant is on the camel. And while they were entering Jerusalem, Omar had to go through a pool of mud. There was a lot of pool, uh, mud in one of the areas. Slick, a lot of dirt. And he went through it and all his clothes became dirty. He has to drag the camel through this pool of mud. And now he's entering the town and he has 14 patches on his shirt. This is the Khalifa. He doesn't even have a new shirt. He has an old shirt and he puts patches, keeps repairing his shirt until he has 14 patches on his shirt. When he enters, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah recognizes who Umar is. The Romans don't know, the Jews don't know, they're waiting for this huge army to come into the town and take over the keys of the city. He goes to Umar ibn Khattab and says, Oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, what are you doing? Look at you, the way. You're dirty, there's all mud over you, you have this old shirt, and you are the one who's taking the camel in, your servant is on top. They are not going to give you respect. I know the Romans, how their kings live. They're not going to give you any respect. Umar ibn Khattab, he punched Abu Hurairah, or Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, the chest. And when Umar punches you, you better fall down. <laughs> You have no choice but to fall down. And if you stand for another punch, you might not survive the second one. So, he goes back and Omar goes to him and he says, Oh Abu Ubaidah, I did not expect this statement from you. He reminds Abu Ubaidah, he says, Who were we a few years ago? Lost in the darkness of kufr, of shirk. What brought us honor in the dunya is Islam. Islam is what brings honor. And whenever we seek honor in anything other than Islam, Allah will humiliate us. These are golden words in history. The golden words of Omar. How true are these words? Whenever we have left Islam, we have been humiliated. We have been humiliated. And Allah will bless us again with this being. The day we want to get blessed again, we want our honor back in the dunya, we have to go back to the deen of Allah have to go back to the deen of Allah. Umar ibn Khattab enters the town. And you know what? The Jews who had come to receive this Khalifa, they see all this happening and they are crying. Anyone knows why they are crying? Why were they crying, the Jews, when they saw Umar ibn Khattab enter the city? Who knows? They had a sign. They had a sign in their book. They were told thousands of years ago by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one day when the king of the believers enters the city, he will have 14 patches on his shirt. Can you imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about Umar thousands of years before Umar ever came into existence? 
and describe to the people of the book one day when Islam will come in, the leader will come in, how will the leader look? That is one of his signs. The leader will have 14 patches on his shirt. And they counted the patches of Umar, they said, 13. You have 13, where is the 14th one? Our book says 14th. And Umar, he raised up his arm and the 14th one was hiding under his armpit. Subhanallah, subhanallah. This is Al-Quds. And you know what? The Muslims, they signed a treaty with the Christians in the area. And one of the terms of the treaty was, you have to throw the Jews out. Whose demand was it? The Christians. The Christians said, the only way we're going to let you enter the city is if you first throw the Yahud out of the city. That was the animosity which was there between the Jews and the Christians. And eventually the Jews left the city uh, in safety from uh, Jerusalem. Anyway, so this was a little bit of history of this area and how it was taken. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, this is the place where Isa salam will descend in the end of times. Bilad al-Sham. This area is blessed. Why? Because the final appearance of a prophet ever in history will take place in this area. We know that the final prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he also told us that Isa alayhi salam is still to come back a second time. Is he coming back as a prophet? Is he bringing new revelation, new religion? No. That's why he's not considered a prophet in his second coming. He's considered a leader. He's considered the Messiah. That's what Messiah means. A king, a leader. And he's going to fulfill that title by leading the believers against the forces of the Antichrist. This is where the final battles will take place. This area. This area is where the final showdown will take place between forces of good and forces of evil. Masih al-Dajjal will be killed in these lands. The Antichrist, the greatest fitna ever to have come on the earth, is going to be finished in these lands. Anyone knows which city Isa al salam will descend? Which city? Damascus. Damascus, very good. Very good, excellent. Damascus is the city where Isa al salam will descend. And the Prophet ﷺ described he will be wearing these two yellowish garments. And his hands will be on the wings of the two angels one when he is coming down. And he will enter the mosque in Damascus. Was there a mosque in Damascus when the Prophet ﷺ mentioned this hadith? Was Damascus even part of the Islamic rule when the Prophet is describing this masjid? SubhanAllah. This is a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. There was no masjid at the time the Prophet is talking about this, this great sign. Later on a masjid is built. And the Prophet peace be upon him even told us which side of the masjid he will come on. The eastern white minaret. The Prophet even mentioned the color. The eastern white minaret is where Isa alayhi salam will descend. In the 90s they changed the color, they painted it white. The masjid was repainted white in the 90s. Before the 90s the masjid in Damascus had a different color. Right now what is the color of the eastern white minaret? White. What is the Prophet peace be upon him say in the hadith? He will descend on the eastern white minaret. That tells you how close we are getting, how things are getting ready to, to take place. Anyway, and then he will lead from there. The one-eyed Dajjal, the Antichrist, cannot enter the city. There are three cities in the world the Antichrist cannot enter. What are the three cities? The three holy cities. Jerusalem, Medina, and Mecca. Jerusalem, Medina, and Mecca. So if tomorrow we have announcement, guys, the Jal is out. Where should we run to? Take the first flight available to Mecca, Medina, or Jerusalem. And that's the option we have. Don't say, no, no, let me wait. Let me wait and see. I can handle the Jal. No, bro, I am a great believer. I am a great Muslim. I can handle the Jal. The Prophet said, when he comes, run away. Don't try to face him. Because you will go to him as a believer and you will return as a disbeliever. That's how powerful the Jal is. That's why he's the greatest fitna. He can change your Iman. He can change your Iman. He will show you things. You'll say, only Allah can do this stuff. Must be Allah. This guy must be Allah. 
because that's what he will claim. He will first claim to be Isa. He will claim to be the Christ. And then later on, he will claim to be God. And he will show great miracles to people, and people will fall for him. So, this is the area where he cannot enter. These three cities are guarded. In this hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, he will prevail all over the earth, apart from Al-Haram, which is in Mecca, and Bayt al-Maqdas, which is in Jerusalem. And in another hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, mentioned how Medina is guarded by angels. The Jal cannot enter Medina. The Dajjal will also be killed in this place, in the Holy Land. He will be killed by the Messiah, Isa ibn Maryam, as is stated in the Hadith, the son of Maryam will kill the Dajjal at the gates of Lud. The Prophet peace be upon him mentions a city, a town known as Lud. And this city, Lod is how it is pronounced in English, is a place near Jerusalem. This is a place near Jerusalem, where the Dajjal will be given. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Masjid al-Aqsa is only one of three masajid you can take a religious journey to. We are not allowed to make pilgrimage to any other masjid except for three masajid, the three holy mosques. What about all those Muslims who go special religious journeys to visit the graves of the saints and the graves of the imams and the graves of the scholars and they do all kinds of shirk in many many places of the world there are huge temples where there are grave sites of spiritual leaders, imams, scholars and you find people make hajj people make hajj to these places we are not allowed to make hajj we are not allowed to make a religious journey except towards these three masajid. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, No journey should be made except to the three mosques, Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Masjid Al-Rasul, which is in Medina, and Masjid Al-Aqsa. Also, this land is the land where everyone will be gathered on the Day of Judgment. When the Day of Judgment comes, the last and final sign of the Day of Judgment is the major sign of a fire which will appear in Yemen. It will start from Yemen and then it will spread in all directions until it will completely envelop the entire known world. And it will gather all the people of the earth towards Jerusalem. Can you understand? Can you picture what this fire is doing? It comes out of Yemen and it starts spreading in all directions until the people, they're trying to avoid this fire, they all end up in this final meeting place, which is the place of Jerusalem, which is the Holy Land, which is Al-Quds. This is where the Day of Judgment will take place. So this is where things come to an end. And the Prophet wasallam, look at this hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Blessed are the lands of Asham. Blessed are the lands of the greater Syria. In that time, the time of the Prophet, Syria did not mean the current Syria we have. It meant all this land to the north of Arabia, included Palestine, included Syria, included the other countries in that area. So he says, Blessed is greater Syria. The companion said, why is that, O Messenger of Allah, why is this land so blessed? The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, because the angels of the Most Merciful spread their wings over it. The angels spread their wings over greater Syria. This is a blessed land. The angels gather around this land. The angels make dua in this land. The angels worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this land. Blessed is greater Syria. What a beautiful land this is. In another hadith, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Allah has assured for me Asham and its people. Allah has assured for me Asham and its people. What does that mean, assured for me? That Allah will forgive them. That Allah will send them to Jannah. These are my people, O oh Allah. I'm going to take them to Jannah. Allah has assured for the Prophet 
promised the Prophet وسلم, the Muslims, the believers of these lands. What a great news that is if you are from these lands. I'm not telling you this so that you can relax. I'm not telling you this so that you could say, well, I am guaranteed Jannah brother, see my passport. <laughs> no, I'm not telling you this because of that. I'm telling you this so that you could be thankful. If you belong to one of these lands, be more thankful to Allah than the rest of the believers. When the Prophet ﷺ would make salah, he would make so much salah that he would stand on his two feet so long that they would swell up. They would swell up due to standing and standing and standing in prayer. Aisha anha said to the Prophet peace be upon him, Why are you torturing yourself? Why are you doing so much? Hasn't Allah forgiven all your past and future sins? Hasn't Allah promised you? He said, then shouldn't I be even a greater thankful servant of Allah? Shouldn't I thank him even more than the other people did? Because he has blessed me. So if you are from these lands, then don't relax regarding your good deeds, but actually become more active. Be more thankful. Make more dua. Make more ibadah. Blessed is this man. Coming to an end, promising you. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I saw a pillar of the book was taken from underneath my pillow and I looked and it was an extending light directed towards a sham. Verily, listen to this, verily Iman at the time of fitna is in a sham. When times are difficult, when times become testing, when the fitna occurs on the land, where will you find the people of Iman? If you want to see the people of Iman in the most difficult circumstances, the Prophet is saying, it is in a sham. It is in this whole land, Syria, Palestine, Jordan, surrounding areas. This is where you will see Iman. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed this land. And you see that, don't you? Don't you see Iman in Philistine, despite all what has happened in the last many, many decades with them? Look at their Iman. Look at what's happening in Syria currently. How much oppression, how much fitna the people are going through. But do you see any dip in their Iman? No, their Iman has skyrocketed in these difficult times. They have become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in these difficult times. So this is where Iman is. If you want to find Iman and you're looking for Iman on earth, go and travel to these lands and you will meet people of Iman. Also, the graves of many of the great Sahaba are found in Bilad al-Sham. The best of men are buried in these lands. After the death of the Prophet wasallam, the Sahaba went in different directions. Many of them went out to fight in the way of Allah. Many of them went out for da'wah to call people towards Islam. A huge majority of the Sahaba went to the north in Bilad al-Sham towards Syria and Palestine and the surrounding areas. This is where, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, people like Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah are buried. Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. You know whom we are talking about? Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, the custodian of the Ummah. The Ameen of the Ummah. The trustworthy one of the Ummah. The Prophet wasallam said, every Ummah as an Amin, every Ummah has a trustworthy one. And the trustworthy one of my Ummah is Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah. He was so great, Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah, that you know when Umar ibn Khattab was dying and he had to decide about the next Khalifa, who will be the next Khalifa, he said, if Abu Ubaidah was living, he would have been my choice. He would have been the third Khalifa. Today we know the four Khulafa, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali. If things had been different, what would you have been hearing all throughout history? You would be hearing Abu Bakr, Umar and Abu Ubaidah. Abu Ubaidah would have been number three. But this is the father of Allah. Allah gives to whomever he wants. Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah is a Shaheed. Why is he a Shaheed? Did he die in the battle? Anyone knows how he died? 
Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah Ta'un 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 the plague the plague of Amwas this was a big plague which took place after Jerusalem was conquered in the Syria the greater Syria almost 25,000 Muslims passed away in this plague it was so widespread 25,000 Muslims died in this plague the Prophet peace be upon him has said whoever dies in a plague is a shaheed is considered a shaheed Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah is considered a shaheed Mu'ad bin Jabal is considered a shaheed he also died in the same plague these two guys are so important that Umar ibn al-Khattab said one day when he was sitting with a group of youngsters and he wanted to teach them, he said, make a wish, make a dua. So they said, I wish this whole room was full of gold and silver. And I would give all of it in the way of Allah. Is it a good wish or not? Imagine if this whole room was full of gold and silver and you were the owner of this gold and silver. And you gave it all in the path of Allah. Wouldn't that be a great deal? It's a good wish, beautiful wish. Umar ibn Khattab is not impressed. Even though for us, wow, what a wish. But for Umar, it's okay. It's all right. And then somebody else stood up, said, I wish this room was full of rubies and emeralds and gems, and I would give in the path of Allah all of them. Umar ibn Khattab was not impressed. And then they said, Oh Umar, oh Amir al-Mu'mineen, you make a wish, you tell us what to wish for, we don't know. He said, I wish. This room was full of people like Abu Ubaidah ibn Jarrah and Mu'ad ibn Jabal and I would send them in the path of Allah. See the value of the human capital? There is nothing that can compete with a human being. No matter how much gold and silver and rubies and emeralds you spend in the path of Allah, it is not the same as training one righteous individual. Training our children to have taqwa. Training our children to have Iman. The human resource is the greatest resource. The greatest resource. Unfortunately, Muslims, we spend millions and millions on making big masajid. Gold and silver, this kind of chandelier and the beautiful carpets. And I'm not saying you should not do that. May Allah accept that from us. But this is not the priority. This should not be the priority. The priority should be investment in education, investment in tarbiyah of our children, investment in good minds, getting skills, skillful people, skillful labor who will make our economies rise, good minds who will be leading us in our Juma khutbas, good intelligent imams, scholars. That's what is really going to make the ummah rise. The Prophet's masjid, if you compare our masjid to the Prophet's masjid. Maybe you and me, many of us, we would not even want to pray in that masjid because we are so spoiled. We're so spoiled. But sometimes I think how the Prophet ﷺ and the Sahaba would pray in the early mornings when it's really dark. And how they would have to light the torches and maintain it with the wind, when the wind blows. And how difficult the prayer becomes in the heat of Medina. You come here for Dhuhr prayer in the summertime and the temperature has gone just in the 80s. Oh, whew. where is the AC? What is the administration of this? Where is the EC? You know, we spend all this money and they cannot give us a nice cool masjid. Where are the fans here? Right? Imagine praying 110, 120 Fahrenheit in Medina. And the Prophet and his companions. No carpets, praying on the earth. No roof. When it rains, imagine if it would rain and snow, and we are praying and we are covered with snow. <laughs> covered with rain. We put our forehead down and the earth is sticking to our, our faces. How would we feel? This is the masjid of the Prophet, the greatest masjid ever, the most blessed masjid ever. It is not the money. It is not the carpets. It is not the capital, the resources. Why was this masjid so great? Because of the people who prayed it. It's the people which make the masjid great. Not these things. So subhanAllah, Umar ibn al-Khattab is telling us the importance of the human capital. 
So these two great Sahaba passed away in the Holy Land. They were, they were buried in the Holy Land and many, many other great Sahaba. Some of the greatest Islamic scholars that we have been gifted with were from this region. One of the greatest, one of my favorites, Imam al-Shafi. Imam al-Shafi, rahmatullah. Great mind. Great mind. Intelligent to the core. Great scholar, but a man of great vision. One of his sayings which I am always fascinated with, Imam al-Shafi, rahmatullah. He said, I do not want to live ever in a town, in a city, which does not have a just ruler, which does not have a flowing river, and which does not have a doctor who is merciful. Three things he wants in a city. If he's going to choose a city, these three things have to be there in the city. The administration, the government has to be just. Justice is very important. Number two, a river which flows. Look at the sense of beauty of Imam al -Shafi. He's not a dry kind of a scholar. He likes to see the nature, live close to nature. Remember Allah when he sees the river flowing. But look at the third one, a physician who is merciful. A doctor of the city who comes to me and when he's injecting that syringe in, he doesn't just, he goes very beautifully swiftly, softly. He has mercy in his heart for his patients. This was his requirement for a good city. That's his definition of a good city. So he came from this land as well. So what can we do? What do we need to do? First and foremost, we need to recognize the importance of these lands. Secondly, we need to love these lands. Are we going to leave inshallah tonight having more love for Bilad al-Sham, for the lands of Asham, for Philistine and the surrounding areas, for the love of this masjid. Inshallah, we're all going to increase in our love for this masjid, Masjid al-Aqsa, more respect for it, more understanding of its importance, inshallah. And then we need to teach to our families. We need to teach to our youth the importance of our holy sites. Every religion has an identity. These masajid are our identity. If we don't talk about them, if we don't remember them, if we do not mention them, then we are kind of losing part of our identity. So let us be proud of this great identity. Let us make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees these lands from oppression. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala free these lands from oppression. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give control to those who have taqwa, to those who have iman, to those who will take care of their responsibility towards these lands, to those who will promote the true religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the true tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all, make us all make salah at least once in our lifetime in Masjid al-Aqsa. Ameen. Once in our lifetime at least in Masjid, in Medina Masjid al-Nabwi. Ameen. And once in our lifetime at least in Masjid al-Haram in Mecca. Ameen. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك ونتوب إليك. anyone has any questions or comments? yes brother. question. why were there so many prophets sent to this particular area? الله أعلم. This is uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decision. He blesses whichever nation he wants, whichever country he wants. I mean, if he sent it to another place, we could have asked the same thing about that other place. This is Allah's qadr, Allah's will. I cannot think of any particular reason why Allah chose this man. But whatever Allah does, there is wisdom in it. Allah Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. The 40 years between the two masajid? The time of Miraj? 40 years? not heard. I mean, it is said that it took place in a moment which is beyond time. Everything took place. The Prophet, peace be upon him, described when he came back, the latch on the door was still moving. When he left for the journey, it was moving. When he came back, it was still moving. Moving. So this happened all of it in a time frame which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala
Does that not have, if you have any further questions, you can always bring